So there's some, there's some kind of theoretical objections to television. Uh, and that's all well and good. Well done to me. But, um, <laughs> but if I'm honest with you, the real problem I've got with television is it's now coming up to 12 years since they've commissioned anything that I've written. Um, <laughs> But it nearly wasn't the case. Um, I'm going to sit down for this bit because uh, it's a little story about uh, the TV. You know? It gives it the flavour of uh, sitting down makes it feel like a sort of Ronnie Corbett monologue, which is good. <laughs> so it nearly wasn't the case. I've been doing this about 20 years, like I said, and uh, I'm on a kind of seven-year cycle of being fashionable, right? Um, and it's good that it's so regular because I can plan expensive medical crises around them. <laughs> and... The last kind of critical peak for good reviews and stuff was about the start of 2006, and we're just on the downside of the curve <laughs> from that now. Um, but anyway, as a result of being trendy about two years ago, I got asked in to see the head of BBC Two, which is really weird, because normally we have to kind of petition them to be seen, but he asked me in. And he said to me, uh, we're all very excited about your work, whatever it is. <laughs> um, you can do anything you like for the channel. What would you like to do? I thought, what was it? So I chanced my arm. I said, I'd like to do six half hours of stand-up, fairly straightforward, like the old Dave Allen shows. He said, you can. You don't need to do a tryout. Get on with it. It won't be a problem. So I left this meeting. I didn't even know what it was for. And when I left, my whole life had been completely transformed, professionally, uh, financially, I suppose, everything. So I started writing this series, right? And I had this idea that each week I'd do a bit where I did... A, a bit of stand-up to a weird group of people in an odd place, right? And I'd film it. So, first of all, I wrote a set that would work for really little kids, right? And it was about how when I was a kid, my mum said, eat your greens, and I didn't. And I got smaller and smaller, and then I got carried off by a bird, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, it's not aimed at you, but they like it, don't they? They like it. <laughs> the people. Yeah. It's for children, really, but, you know. Imagine me being carried off by a bird. It'd be hilarious. <laughs> Help! So, um, especially it was a funny bird, eh? like a budgie or something. <laughs> so, um, I started doing this at like kids' parties and stuff with a view to filming it at some point. And kids are really funny, right, because they don't heckle. But what they do do is they put their hands up like that. And then you have to decide whether to accept the heckle. <laughs> it's a good system, you know. So, I was doing this kids party on a Sunday afternoon, I was talking about becoming really small and whatever, and this little girl, about seven, put her hand up. And I went, what? And she said, if you were so small then, why are you so fat again now? <laughs> and that's funny, isn't it? So, um, no, it is, you know. So I said to her, well, uh, I may be fat, but at least I've got some pubic hair. <laughs> Because the old skills kick back in, Glasgow. <laughs> 20 years, 20 years, night after night after night. I didn't want to say it, but it's like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> Pavlov's dog. Any seven-year-olds that cross me will be crushed into the ground because they don't have 20 years of road-hardened skills. And the other thing I wanted to do, right, <laughs> wasn't just that. Uh, I wanted to do like a kind of parody of observational comedy. Now, stand audience, you see lots of comedy, you'll know what observational comedy is. Observational comedy is when the comedian pretends to have the same life as you, right? Uh, <laughs> rather than being a philandering coke addict. <laughs> and, uh, so, this is what observational comedy is like, and it? it's like this. Once I'm the observer, aren't you? Hey, oh, who's uh, who's married? Who's married? Who's got a girlfriend? Who's ever seen a woman? You've seen a photo of one? You know what they are? You've seen them around, yeah, yeah. Not men with the hair. Yeah. Are there any in? Any women in? Any women? Girls, answer me this. Why did you take so long to get ready? What's what's going on? Uh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's why did you take so long to get ready? What's going on? What? Who's got kids? That's finished, that bit. Who's got kids? It's finished! It's finished! It's finished. Who's got kids? I've got a little boy. Have you got a little boy? How old is he? Fourteen. Mine's three. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Some of the things he says, though, they're mad. It's hilarious. It's mad. It's like he can only understand the world from the perspective of a child. 
Anyway. I've got a terrible feeling there's some people at the back there going, now he's cooking, now he's cooking. <laughs> why, is... so, why do they take so long to get ready, the women? If only we could ask them. <laughs> but they'd go mad. So, I thought, what's the best way to do a parody of observational comedy? And the best way to do a, a parody of observational comedy, I thought, was to do it from the point of view of an insect about being an insect whilst dressed as an insect, right? So, I'm an insect comedian, right? I'd be like this, I'm an insect, yeah? Oh, oh right, who's, uh, who's killed a grasshopper? Come on. We've all done it, haven't we? Friday night, we've all done it. There's a bloke down there laughing. He's on film now. He's on film and he's done it. And um, we've all done it Friday night. We killed a grasshopper. You get them, don't you? In your mandibles, yeah? And... Uh, not what you were thinking, mandibles, yeah? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? You get them and you spit your enzymes onto them, don't you? Yeah? Your enzymes, yeah? You spit your enzymes on them, on the gasshoppers, to dissolve them, yeah? Into a liquid, yeah? You dissolve them into a liquid, yeah? So you can feed them to your grub. Who's got a little grub? Who's got a little grub? I've got a little grub. Honestly, some of the things he says, they're mad. <laughs> It's hilarious. It's like you can only understand the world from a larval perspective. <laughs> so, I wanted to do that insect comedy, but I didn't know where to film it, right, for this programme that I was given. And then it turned out, as luck would have it, that in March last year, there was a three-day event happening at Barnes Reservoir, the Wildlife Reserve in southwest London, and there were entomologists, insect scientists coming from all over the world for a three-day celebration of insects. And this event was called Pestival, right? That isn't, <laughs> that's not my joke, that's an entomologist's joke. <laughs> Don't judge me. And um, on the opening night, I found out they were having a, an insect-themed cabaret to welcome all the entomologists, right? And they'd already booked Robin Hitchcock, the singer-songwriter, because he's got loads of songs about bees and ants and things. And they booked this saxophonist, David Rothenberg, who was going to improvise live to a tank of crickets and stuff, right? So I, it was, it was, it was good, actually. So, so I rang up the organiser, Bridget Nichols, and I said to her, can I come to Pestival and do half an hour of stand-up about being an insect whilst dressed as an insect to the world's 300 leading insect scientists? And she said, yes, that would be exactly appropriate. <laughs> But she said, we can't pay you. Uh, do you love insects? I said, yeah, I love insects. <laughs> I love them. And then she said, also, uh, there's a party of entomologists in from Prague, and we're excited to have them, because they made a breakthrough study last year into the life cycle of the potato peach aphid. So it would be really great, she said, if most of your uh, <laughs> gags and quips could be about aphids. And I said, that's fine, I've got loads. <laughs> I've got loads, because I started out doing stand-up in the 80s. You remember stand-up in the 80s? It was all uh, aphid stuff, wasn't it? Aphids and, uh, and Thatcher, the, mil uh, the milk snatcher, remember? Snatching all the milk. So, um, so, I, uh, so I rang up this guy, Martin Stone. You know, I paid him 500 quid to make the insect costume. I thought, I'll get that back from the, uh, the programme eventually. And the producer said he could secretly film it for this TV series. And then about two days later, my then manager, uh, Don Rodeo, he got, a, uh, <laughs> he got an email from the BBC withdrawing the offer of the whole series out of nowhere. Now, I mean, I was disappointed, obviously, but it was a strange disappointment. Because the whole thing had always seemed too good to be true. You don't, you don't get what you always want, it just doesn't happen, getting what you want. But what would happen, it's like going up to a little child and going, hello, what thing would you like to have most in the world? What's your favourite thing? What? A toy red fire engine, is it? Well, I've got one for you, there you are, that's for you. And that light flashes and the ladder goes up, and that's, no it is, it's for you, you really can have it, really. Take it, there it is. Oh dear, it's been smashed in front of your stupid fighting face! <laughs> Don't.
don't ever dream. <laughs> but there were some practical problems with the sudden withdrawal of this work. First of all, um, I'm self-employed. I uh, hadn't set up any other work. I've got a, we had a little baby due at the time. And uh, the other problem was it meant that I was now contractually obliged <laughs> to go to festival <laughs> at Barnes Reservoir and do half an hour of stand-up about being an insect whilst dressed in a now unjustifiably expensive <laughs> insect costume to 300 of the world's leading entomologists for no fucking reason. <laughs> and all I'm saying, Glasgow. <laughs> Is does that seem to you like something that should happen to the 41st best stand up? <laughs> 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. I should not, at this stage in my career, I should not have to go to a reservoir. <laughs> To do half an hour of standing about aphids. <laughs> but no, I, I should at least be paid for that. <laughs> and after 20 years, the places I perform, their principal purpose should not be the storage of water. <laughs> they should be theatres or whatever this is. <laughs> A, a cesspit with lights. <laughs> I, sh I, sh I shouldn't even be in Glasgow at all. I should do. I do a month in Edinburgh every summer. You should just travel. Just travel. <laughs> it's so near. It's the same city, basically. <laughs> it's a joke, isn't it? Forty first. What? I, 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 well, I don't even have to. I can, I can come. What, five feet from the front row? I don't even need to look round to know that there's people that can't even be bothered to turn 30 degrees. <laughs> no, we'll just... We'll, he'll come back, probably. <laughs> I don't know what this bit is, anyway. Is it innovation or a mistake? <laughs> I'll just look at nothing, I'll look at nothing. Or at that. Can I have a backdrop? Yeah. What would you like? Can it be in my face? Yeah, we'll just distort it a bit. What? <laughs> I should get respect. I should get... Re at, the, at the very least, from children. There shouldn't be seven-year-old kids shouting out at me that I'm fat. <laughs> I am fat, but not by the standards of a comedian. <laughs> Roy Chubby Brown is fat. That is in, that's in his name. <laughs> and Fatty Arbuckle. Fatty Arbuckle. Yeah, and large. 